You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, we are going over to the UK to be joined by Felix Valardi, the CEO of 2Y3X. Felix, you're very welcome to the show. Brilliant. It's lovely to be here. Yeah, delighted to have you. I like the beard you're going to do, the mustache. It's nice. <laughs> um, typical fashion with this podcast, focus on three main areas, uh, early influences, challenges, and pivotal moments. So... Uh, based in the UK. I don't know if you live in the Cotswold now. I may have caught that on an interview. I think you grew up in London. Um, I guess. So I grew up in the middle of London, in southwest London, Ballam, uh, and uh, moved all over the place, lived in New York and Paris for a bit and all over, and then found myself completely by accident living back in Ballam on the same street as my nursery school. uh, it just totally coincidentally so um yeah a weird sort of uh circular journey something i've been meaning to ask you through my research i noticed you've been involved with nightclubs was that throughout school university uh as a means to make some money to get through university more of a social side of things i ask because i was heavily involved in nightclubs for a number of years myself as well <laughs> excellent um no it was pure hedonism i think <laughs> um when I was, so I did really, really well at school. And then I went to a sixth form college and I discovered, I came to this realization I was being part, uh, taught how to pass A levels. And I got really thoroughly frustrated with it. And at the same time, I'd, I'd discovered um, girls and going and get, getting drunk. And I just thought, you know what? I hate this education thing. Where can I where can I go uh, to have more parties? So I, I left college. So I don't, didn't go to university um, uh, and went to work in a nightclub. So uh, actually, it was it was childish or, or youthful hedonism more than anything else. And then you know I've 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 kept in touch with those roots. I still go to Burning Man. I still go to one festival a year just to keep my hand in to pretend that I'm still eighteen when I'm in my mid fifties. <coughs> And uh, yeah, I mean, I still consider it to be fun. One of the things that I've taken away from my time spending in event industry, nightclub industry, is the connections that I've built and how it uh, improved my communication style um, and how I communicate with others. Uh, Are there any lessons that you took from your time spent in the event industry that you still use to today? Um. I think the, 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 there's there's a classic thing called the waiter rule, which is you can judge other people by the way that they treat their waiters. And I learned that when I was working in hospitality, I think that you come across a lot of people who talk a really good game about how they're friendly and they're nice to everybody and they've got great values and all of that. And, and values is really important to me, and especially in business. Um, and, and yet they treat the staff, the, the invisible people, uh, badly and and even today I mean you know I'm I, I socialize a lot or, or I <laughs> if pre-pandemic pre-pandemic I socialized a lot um, the first people I always make friends with are the staff and if I want to find out whether a customer is any good I'll talk to the staff about them because I think it's it's you should treat people like people no matter what station they're in and I think that uh, that carries through the easiest, quickest way to judge whether somebody is um, uh, nice or nasty is to watch how they treat the people around them, including the people who, uh, as it were, don't matter to them. I agree. I completely agree. You've touched on Burning Man before. And before we move on to all good things in, related to business, mm-hmm. uh, I have I, noticed that you're an uh, annual attendee. We've also mentioned You've been involved in the nightclub industry. What's one thing you're into or curious about that not a lot of people would know about you? Uh, well, I love adventure. Um, I've done my fair share of, more than my fair share, I guess, of uh, things like bungee jumping and abseiling down Battersea Power Station. And, and I guess, you know, I'm a classic CEO type. I'm, I'm uh, outgoing, assertive. Uh, and a lot of people think that CEOs are risk takers. And if you look on the surface of the things that I've done, uh, paragliding and, you know, I've got a competition license for um, flying gliders. Wow. 
uh, and it's awesome and it's fun. Nobody really sees that what goes on behind the scenes is before I get into a, a glider, I'll spend an hour looking at every single pin on the damn thing, including inside the wings, to make sure that it's, it's put together properly. Um, risk taking is about calculated risks, is about understanding what could possibly go, go wrong and then doing something to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I, I guess that's the same in business, but I, I do love the, a, a good adventure me. So what you're saying is you make sure you don't overlook any of the potential things that could go wrong. So going into business, you've set up or founded many businesses yourself, five or six, I believe. Um, when setting up a business, what are some of the things that you believe people often overlook but are crucial, particularly in that early stage? Uh, so many I think the right people, having the right people around you, going into business with the right people is, is the most important thing. And, and when I say the right people, I mean people who share your values. And when I say values, I mean your core personal values. I don't mean the color of your skin or what school you went to or what, you know. It, what I mean is uh, if truth is really, really important to you, work with people who also believe that truth is really important to them. If... Uh, being um, um, assertive and ambitious is really important to you, uh, then work with people who share that view. I think it's really, really important that you surround yourself with people who share your personal values. And, and to counter that, you also need to make sure that those people who share your personal values are as diverse as possible. And I don't mean that as in, in specifically in terms of diversity and inclusion, but I do mean people who think different, who come from different backgrounds, who didn't take the journey that you took, uh, because diversity of thinking is critical to making great decisions. Yeah, solid point. Um, and and I, I agree completely with you. Focusing on challenges, um, I'm sure you face your, your fair share of them, mm. um, although you've achieved a lot. What are some challenges that you've faced uh, that you didn't necessarily expect or account for and then how did you overcome them you can go as far back as early days you can go some that came up uh, numerous times or you can look at the last 18 months well i mean listen i've 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 had a lot of businesses um and i've chaired a lot of businesses and, and i still look after a lot of businesses and I've made every single mistake that you can possibly make. And I've probably made them all 18 times. And I really shouldn't have. And, and one of the problems with business is that most entrepreneurs, most founders learn business through trial and error. And I'll say that again. Most founders learn business through trial and error. That can and be expensive. And it is. It, God, it's so time consuming. I spent the first 10 years of my business career, my first three or four companies, learning through trial, trial and error. And actually we've been running businesses for 150 or 170 years in exactly the same way, the same principles apply. And so trial and error shouldn't, sh shouldn't be a, a factor. And so my kind of, my, my mission is to take away the trial and error and that's hence what I do for a living and, and how I do it. But it's, the, I think my first biggest mistake was not getting outside advice, not getting help, not listening to people who've been there before me. Steve Jobs said, you never see the, the you don't know how the dots line up until you look at them uh, uh, backwards or from, from, <laughs> from the end. Um, and, it, and that's so true. And there are plenty of people, non-exec directors and board advisors and chairs and things like that, um, who have been through it, who do know what it's like. When I first, I found my first mentor, which is literally 10 years after I started my first business, it was a total revelation, it turned my world upside down. And a, a, a chap called Charles Llewellyn and forever grateful. He's, he's, he was an amazing man, he is an amazing man, inspiration. But he also, he gathered around him a group of people who together they taught me everything that I know in business and, and all of those lessons have stayed with me. This is interesting because to, to some degree you're in the consulting business and um, been involved in it myself. Um, the cost to entry is essentially nothing. Uh, and many people will have high level jobs, C-suite jobs and companies, 
attempt to do consultancy and typically last six to eight months and then you'll see them go back. But that aside, why is it that you think so many of these founders, MDs, CEOs who run companies and make those mistakes repetitively uh, do that when there's so many uh, consultants or consultancy companies out there that have uh, evidence backed you know, they, they can say, look, we've helped A, B, C, and D. Mm-hmm. I know, I know, I know there's tons that like come in and come out and wh- wh- whatever their agenda it's is. It's like anything else. Most of them yeah. are rubbish, right? Yeah. Uh, but there well, are those staple companies out there that, that are there. Why is it that you think that people don't leverage them or go to them? Well, if, if I look to myself, I mean, you know, sample of one, but, but a good uh, example I thought I could do it myself. I thought I was bright enough and, you know, chippy enough and uh, I had enough drive and I thought I was clever enough to do it myself. And that kind of arrogance and ego is, is part of the, 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 the reason that as an entrepreneur, you feel that you can do it in the first place, right? A lot of people mm. start businesses because they, they, they feel that they are the best placed person to realize their vision. Now that's probably true, but the problem is then that running a business or learning how to run a business gets in the way of them executing their vision. And and I would love to see um, people not having to go through that trial and error bit and just change the world because that would be amazing. And we all start businesses because we want to change things for the better. When was it that that penny dropped for you that you decided maybe I should go and get a mentor or go on X, Y, and Z course. I think it was, it was, I'd hit a plateau and I'd hit probably the same plateau for the, I don't know, 10th time. And, and with each of my first few businesses, my first two or three businesses, you get to, uh, you get to a million basically through uh, force of will, right? You get to 2 million because you've got product market fit and and some really good people. And then you spend your time optimizing what you've done and what you've got until at 2 million, it's a well-oiled machine. And then you hit this plateau, the ceiling, and you think, why am I not scaling? Why can't I scale? And the reason you can't scale is because you perfected a system that was brilliant for getting you to 2 million, but is no good for getting you to 4 million or 10 million. And what you then need to do is you need to scrub out the old system and start a new system. And one of the problems with that is nobody wants to change something that's worked. And and that's what my company TY3X does. We do that, we affect that transformation because it can only be done from the outside. And it took me years to realize that I kept hitting the same barrier. And and it was, you know, when you're a kid and you think, what is it that the grown-ups aren't telling me? What's the secret about being a grown-up? Mm. Why won't they tell me, right? And I spent my childhood, you know, years of my childhood thinking, what is the secret? Why won't they tell me the secret? One day I'll know the secret, right? And it was a bit like that, being an entrepreneur. It's, what's the secret? Why won't they tell Damn, why don't I just ask? <laughs> mm. And that was my breakthrough moment. Is that what you call the plateau de gloom? Yeah, it is. It's It's... And people call it different things. It's it's the business plateau. Mm. It's the plateau of gloom, we call it. It's um, uh, feast and famine. You know, it's that bit where you keep making 10% progress and then falling back 10% and then making 11% progress and then falling back 11%. And the problem there is you're then at the whim of margin of error. You're never going to, if you set your goals at 10 or 20%, uh, it's moot whether you're going to make 10 or 20% or you're going to lose 10 or 20% or you're going to stagnate. And most businesses just stagnate because they don't know what to do. Mm. And at that point, a lot of people say, do you know what? We'll sell the business. And the problem is if you're selling a business at that level, you're selling it for far too little when all you need to do is get the key and unlock the transformation that will allow you to scale. And 2Y3X is that key. Price is important when it comes to that. You've said price for your value, not the dollar, pound, euro amount. So the listeners, can you explain what you mean by that? 
Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, we, we, we have a uh, hundred years of uh, economic theory that says if you, pri if you price on commodity, then eventually your competitors will come in and undercut mm -hmm. you and get a race to the bottom, right? Um, if you truly believe that what you are delivering has value to the buyer, then your, the value of what you are selling is just as important as the value of what the buyer is going to give you for your product or service. Yeah, your, your, your product or service is the prize. Now it's either a really high value prize or it's a low value prize, it doesn't matter. If the, if the customer is willing to pay um, one, one end or the other, then that's what they should be paying. You shouldn't try and undercut yourself to start, to start with. But you know, my, we, we double revenue over the course of the two years or we triple it, occasionally we triple it. Um, and doubling your revenue, if you're doing two million quid, well, you don't want to be charging 10 grand for that or tuppence halfpenny. You should be charging something that is commensurate with the value of what we're delivering. Or we happen to charge something akin to, I don't know, 10% of, of, but we don't do it on a percentage, it's a flat fee and we guarantee results and all of that kind of stuff. But it's, it's, if you truly believe that there's value in what you do, then charge for that value. And if your customer truly believes that there is, uh, value that they want, they will pay for that value. And then you've got a transaction that is a transaction of equals rather than something that's got some kind of power dynamic in it. I love that. And people are an important part of that journey as you scale a company. People I'm referencing employees, uh, motivating people is a commonly discussed topic. From my end, one of the ways to motivate is to tie corporate goals to personal goals. I'm sure you have uh, your own thoughts on this when it comes to motivating employees for you what's the first thing that comes to mind it's funny there are two different things because i've got my own company mm -hmm. which is multinational uh and obviously i work with companies who want to scale their company so we're advising them how to do this sort of uh, how to bring your people along with you mm. my own company's structured uh, I, I, I'd love to think that it's structured really purely and so on, but it remains to be seen and things morph and change as, as uh, others get involved. But we, we, you know, all of everything that we do, all of our consultants uh, get paid a huge bonus if they get the client to the results. So we align what we're doing with um, what our clients get and what our clients want. But I, my, listen, when it comes to how you motivate people. I think the best motivation is giving people responsibility for making decisions, giving people responsibility for creating and designing the uh, solutions to the scaling problems that you're going to face. Um, and, I, and I think it's a partly about, that's partly about getting people around you who share your values, but, but also you know, most leaders say, well, it's my vision, I'm going to do it. You've all got to do it the way I say, you, you, you do what I say. And the reality is people aren't motivated by that. People are motivated by bringing to life something that they've co-invented. So creating an atmosphere and a system and a process where your people can take responsibility for your company's future. Partly that's the most motivating thing that you can possibly do, but also, it frees you up from having all of that responsibility and stress. And personally, I, I kind of, I semi-retired when I was 47 because I hated all of the stress and the responsibility. And what I discovered over the course of the, the subsequent six or seven years is, is if, if you don't take on that stress, you don't have that stress. If you distribute the responsibility for the future and the design of the future to a bunch of people who really want that kind of responsibility, superstars then guess what everybody's going to be happier mm -hmm. what's your favorite aspect of leading a company seeing other people fulfilling their dream the, the the joy for me in what i do is seeing when the team realizes that it's doing the stuff on its own without leadership that's the joy when it comes to the industry that you're in, is there a commonly held belief that you passionately disagree with? Yeah, it's that, it's that the, the, the leader is the, is the font of all wisdom. 
and frankly, there's, that's a load of old Coswallop. Um, the, the, the leader is there to foster an environment where other people can thrive. And uh, if they come up with better solutions than the one that you came up with, then fantastic. Um, and and I, I, have a, I, I, I had recently a brilliant coaching session with somebody who coached me. And, uh, and he, he allowed me to, see, to make an attitude shift in myself. Hmm. And the attitude shift was, it was like a sort of half a degree of correction to the way I looked at the world. And it's, 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 and I should have had this over and over again, and I preach it, so I should have realized that it's, it's, it applies to me too. Hmm. My job is not to find people who want to execute my vision as a leader. My job is to find people who want to execute their version of a vision that fits with mine and then to give them the freedom to do so. Sounds like you've got a real passion for what you do and what you've achieved over your uh, 50 years on this planet. One side question would be uh, partly related. Uh, I believe they're called A-levels in the UK. It's called a Leaving Cert in Ireland. If you could add one mandatory subject to the A-levels, what would it be? Uh, empathy. Classes in empathy. Why would you choose empathy? Because it's not covered at school. I, I, my school experience was, was largely vile. Um, and, and, and you get taught an awful lot of stuff that you are never going to use. Never in a million years going to use. And yet you don't get taught the stuff that's really important. How do I how to empathize and sympathize with people who don't share your background or your culture or your, you know, how to, how to deal with people who speak a different language or have a different mode of thinking, how to, how to get the best out of people by giving them space. So I was all, never to, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like understanding everyone's individual communication styles. So you could be able to connect faster, uh, uh, and get to where you want to get to like if I know that you're a highly direct person and you don't like small talk well then when I'm talking to you it's probably the easiest to get straight to the point whereas if you're the opposite style of that then I might want to spend some time small talking with you I, I, I don't think it's quite as specific as that I think and one of the problems with that kind of approach is that it could become manipulative and you see people doing neuro-linguistic programming courses and things so that they can do that kind of thing and, and create false empathy. It's really just, I'll give you an example. Uh, my sister had a boyfriend who was incredibly popular, but he never spoke, he never really said anything. And uh, I had dinner with him one evening. I don't know why I had dinner with him. We were 19 or something. It's not something you kind of really do, really, when you're 19. Um, but we sat down, we were having dinner together. And I said, what, what is it? What's your secret? And he said, I just pe ask people about them. And it was a complete revelation. I'd spent my entire life up until then just talking about myself. And it's this basic kind of, do you know what? Give people space, they'll explain themselves. You don't need to guess, you don't need to know, you don't need to intuit, but there are a few tips and rules and things that make it easier for you to communicate with people who aren't from your tribe. Was there something about him that you were attracted to? Uh, other than the fact that it was, he was really popular and he was going out with my sister. Um, no, he was, I, I, you know, he and I were friends and we liked each other, he was, uh, he was a good man. So I probably wanted to be as popular as him. <laughs> <laughs> All the kids in school probably want to be the popular kid when they're at school. Um, yeah. Interesting choice, empathy. Um, and the only reason I say interesting is because um, there's a lot of... So I'll backtrack for a second. In the role that I've been in sales for five, six years time, I always wondered why they never finished top of the list. And anyone who's listened to previous podcasts will probably recognize where I'm going with this. I did, I did a Google search once, you know, is there a list out there that salespeople finish the top of? And there's one list and it's a list of 
uh, the role that has the highest percentage of organizational psychopaths. And they finished <laughs> third, third in the list. <laughs> Above that is a uh, news anchor, like TV presenters, uh, so involved the media and then lawyers are, are top of that list. Um, and I just don't know if, um, like, if someone's thought that, would they just use it as a tool to take advantage of other people? Um, could those people care or they just, is it something that they just, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's something that they just use as a tool to kind of get to that next step where, where, where they want to get to. I don't know if everyone's built for that course that you'd like to have. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I mean, uh, this is my, my confession time. I didn't complete my A-levels, right? In fact, I said that at the beginning of this interview. Um, so, uh, you know, adding adding yet more A-levels that I'm not going to complete is uh, probably a, 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 a silly thing to try and do. But I just think that school is 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 great at, at sort of shoveling useless facts into your head and appalling at helping you to become uh, socially um, aware and to have a positive impact. The number of people coming out of schools wanting to change the world for the better because of their schooling uh, is, is, is lamentably low. There's, there, so two, two things on that. First of all, there's, there's a lot of things that schools are good for. However, I will say that um, I'm an average student. Uh, we do the leaving certificate over here. You do your six best subjects. You get a, a scale of one to 100. 100 is 100%. You get, you're trying to go for 600 points. I got 355, which is bang average for people over here. Uh, but I will, what I will say is the, what I noticed was that school is essentially uh, to see uh, who can remember the most and jot it down on paper come exam time. Um I will credit my parents being from a family that uh, got the most out of me and continued to uh, be great parents for the outside school version of me. Um, but I will say that it's a, it's, it's a place that's not suited for everyone. And I've seen a lot of people who didn't necessarily strive in school completely strive outside of school because it's a different skill set required and vice versa. I've seen those some in school that when they leave school, they completely crumble. So, mm. um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> I don't know. That. It, it, school felt to me to be doing a, very little of the useful things. And, and so I gave up on it uh, when I shouldn't have. I say shouldn't have. Uh, my parents think I shouldn't have. But it turns out I've been quite successful. So, I mean, you know. Well, that's what I was going to lead to. You have been quite successful. And, and it, you, you, you come across as the type of person from research who uh, in continuously invests in himself whether it's through courses, books, podcasts. And when I say books or podcasts, I don't necessarily just mean reading a book, putting it down, picking up the next book, reading a book. It's reading a book and putting into action something that you've taken from the book. So, uh, and same with courses, not just sitting at the back of the classroom on your laptop, not paying attention. So when it comes to investing in yourself, are there any books, podcasts, mentors that you go to to continue to invest in yourself? So Charles started my journey of learning, uh, Charles Llewellyn, and, and the cohort of people that were around us, including some people who now are involved my, with my business 25 years later or 20 years later. Um, uh, so that, that journey started with reading, I think, Good to Great by Jim Collins, mm. and, and then a whole series of amazing books that he recommended. And then... Uh, I went on a, a, a speed reading course run by a guy called Jan Chizek, which was amazing. It teaches you five different ways of doing speed reading, which is essentially strip mining a book. Mm. So you, it's evil and underhand and uh, disrespectful, but it gets you the content of the book. It's like a juicer, right? And uh, so I suddenly started reading a lot of business books, or at least speed reading them. And that became the foundation for 
uh, my learning. And I then put all that into practice with the companies that I was running. You know, I bought one of my companies. I told the company, the new buyers were running it into the ground. I bought it back. I doubled its revenue in a year using the principles that I'd learned. Wow. And, and then I ran an agency group. I was CEO of an agency group. And uh, then I stopped everything and started doing 2Y3X and scale at speed. And that was just turning it into the framework. And as a result of that, I constantly people are saying to me, oh, have you read such and such? Because they assume that I should be well read, even though I'm, I'm just well exposed. Um, and so I have to read. So by the next morning, I'll have spent 15 minutes strip mining the book and getting the answer. So yeah, so I do. I, Whenever anybody recommends a book, I will speed read it. And if I really want to then go back and read it. So anything by Patrick Lencioni, for example, you, mm. you start speed reading and then you think, do you know what? I just want to I wallow in this and enjoy it for what it is. Um, so there are some books like I've just read, uh, I speed read a book called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. Um, and it was so good by the time I got about halfway through it that I went back to the beginning and started slow reading it. It's the most dog-eared book that I've read in the huh. last um, couple of years. It's amazing. Um, and, you know, there, there are some amazing books. I've just read Scarcity by Melanathan and Shafir, which is about the bandwidth tax that comes with poverty. Um, and, sat, you know, we do a lot of pro bono work in minority communities here and in the Middle East and in the States. And um, uh, that, was, that book, Scarcity, was just an eye-opener and a salutary lesson, a reminder that we are... We live in such a privileged world. Mm. You've mentioned speed reading. There's an app that I use. I have to give it a shout out. It's called Blinkist. It essentially. Oh, yeah, very good. You, you, you're familiar with it? Yes, I am. Um, nice. I, I, it, it is very good. It's not the way that I, it's not the method that I prefer. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fantastic app. I'd like you to imagine it's the year 2030 and you're looking back on the last decade. You can answer this personally or professionally. <laughs> imagining that it's now 2030 and we're chatting what would you like to be looking back on i would so it's, i don't mean this to sound incredibly self-serving and e egotistical but it's going to sound incredibly self-serving and egotistical i just published my book scale of speed which is the manual for how you do the transformation to allow your business to scale mm -hmm. hence the title scale of speed how to triple the size of your business and build a superstar team. It's the methodology behind 2Y3X. And I'm a passionate believer that you give away your secrets freely because if they're valuable, people will then come back to you and ask your advice. Um, so I'm hoping that in 2030, I'm, I'm just about to start um, giving lectures again at Halt International Business School, which I've been an adjunct professor at in the past. And, and, and very silly side story. Ronan Grunbaum, who's the uh, Dean at Halt, was one of the people to review the book for the jacket and uh, wrote a very kind review. And he, we were talking about me coming back onto the faculty um, or, or as an adjunct. And he said, by the way, what is your degree in? I said, I don't really have a degree. I've got a A-level in art that I got when I was 14 and nothing else. And he said, ah, you're a specialist then. <laughs> so I would love to think that in 10 years time, scale at speed is being taught widely and that it's taken away some of the pain for a lot of entrepreneurs so that they can change the world. Because if, if that's the outcome, I will be very, very pleased indeed. I do hope you achieve that. Focusing on last couple of questions today, rather than 2030. Um, there's a book that I read before that kind of identifies at the time, they believe 13 hidden blind spots that, you know, businesses can, healthy businesses can overlook or ignore. Um, you could add a 14th to it being a, a worldwide pandemic, but we'll keep it at 13. Um, a couple of them are like uh, lead generation, um, motivating, um, fostering a culture of learned helplessness, hiring. In today's world, as in 2021, June 2021, is there a standout, I'm going to use the word blind spot, but is there a standout blind spot that you see 
companies in the area that you work with, helping them scale, you know, two, three X in two years, that uh, is, is, is a common thing amongst all companies that you're currently helping them fix? One of the first, so there are two things, actually. One is nobody's proposition is good enough. A, a proposition really needs to polarize people either in or out. You're either unequivocally not going to be a customer of, of that company or unequivocally, uh, unequivocally going to be a customer of that company. And the polarization of potential customers is one of the easiest ways of getting incoming business coming to you. Um, so that's the first thing that usually we address in the program. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is kind of a universal truth and it's an unwelcome one. But, but actually, funnily enough, it completes the circle. It comes all the way back to core values. Every company, or almost every company, has got C players. C players are the disengaged, the naysayers, the people who hold people back, the, the, the people who don't turn up or they don't put in the effort or they bring people down or they undermine new and novelty. Those C players need to go. Do you think that's a hiring or onboarding problem or training problem? Well, the, 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 if, you've, if you've got C players, which most people do, then it's a, you know you need to get rid of them, get, rid, get them off the bus. They will be A players somewhere else. And mm. the reason that they're C players is not because they're bad people. It's not because they're not good at their job. It's because they don't share your values and therefore you're not communicating and motivating them in the right way. And you can't because you don't share your core values. They'll be far happier working somewhere where, which does share their values, where they will be happy and motivated and, and become superstars. That's fantastic. Most C players in your company will be somebody else's B or A players. Great, move them there. They'll be happier, you'll be happier. Everybody in your team will come to you and say, I don't know why you didn't do it six months ago. The number of times I've spoken with a leader and they say, yeah, but that person's responsible for culture. It's like, hello. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, to your question, it is about hiring. It's about understanding what your core values are and making certain that those are reflected in your hiring process. There's a theory that I'd love for all people to, even just at a base level, be aware of what it is and it's all your theory. Because once people can separate their identity from the role and realize they, as a human, are a, a 10, but in, in an individual role, they might be like, for example, as a football player, I'm probably a one out of 10. I am not a Cristiano Ronaldo, but as a human, I'm a 10 out of 10. And that goes to the place where you're mentioning C players in, let's choose the title of SDR. As an SDR, you might not be, you know, a 10 out of 10, but it doesn't mean as a human, you're not a 10 out of 10, which is why I think that it will be great for people to understand the baseline concept of what IOR theory is. So that if that conversation ever does come up, they can be aware that, as a human, they're no worse than they were yesterday, but just in that specific role, it might not suit them. Yeah, uh, and I agree. And, and it comes, you know, there's a, an author called Rand Fishkin who started a company called uh, SEO Moz, um, which was one of the first big SEO companies in the US. Um, and he wrote a book called Lost and Founder about his trials and tribulations as a uh, a fumbling CEO, somebody doing it by trial and error. And one of his great learnings was, was, was understanding the Peter Principle. The Peter Principle is most people get promoted to the level of their incompetence. Yeah, because there's nowhere else to go. And then they become incompetent and then they're a failure and demotivated and then you have to fire them. Mm. It's an appalling tra tragedy. And he came up with a structure in his company where People could become individual con uh, contributors and become more senior than their managers because they were brilliant at sales or at engineering or whatever it was. And the manager was brilliant at managing. And everybody needs some kind of hierarchy. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of work with Holacracy. Even that's a hierarchy. Um, so there needs to be some way of managing systems and processes and people. And possibly you need to get the right person to do the management not the best person at the the role that is being managed yeah 
well, time and time and time again, it shows that not all great salespeople are great sales managers, but time and time and time again, in most companies, great salespeople are promoted to become sales managers. Yes, which is which happened to me once, and and, and appalling, appalling mistake uh, by everybody concerned. Well, we'll leave it on this final question. Business aside, I've thoroughly enjoyed our chat. If you could travel to any country in the world right now, all restrictions are lifted, where would you go to? Right now, New Zealand. <laughs> I've had my second jab. I tested negative yesterday. Um, I have always wanted to go, and it's it's it looks like a wonderful place. I'm not sure that they would, uh, with any degree of uh, sensibleness, let me in, uh, and quite rightly. Um, but I'd, I've always wanted to go. It looks beautiful. Never been. Closest I got was I lived in Australia for a year. But uh, I, ho I hope you do get to go one day. But for now, Felix, uh, again, thoroughly enjoyed our chat. Wishing you nothing but the best and, and hope that your vision for 2030 does come through one day. But we'll leave it here for today. Thank you very much indeed, Rian. Pleasure.